So once again, I want to welcome everyone to the uh, on behalf of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Administration for Community Living, and the Indian Health Service. Please note the webinar series is supported by a contract awarded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The opinions, finding, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in the webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Today's presenters I'd like to introduce are, um, we have four just absolutely uh, phenomenal people. The first is Emily Houses, and she is a research scientist at Pierce Southwest in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Dr. House's research is guided by the health and wellness priorities of the Native American partners with whom she collaborates. Her scholarship focuses on social justice and health equity, with a specific interest in, a death, in addressing early mortality, end of life care, cancer symptom, symptom management, and health promotion across the lifespan. Um, next, we have Kathleen and Kathleen Wilking is a medical anthropologist and senior research scientist at the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation. Her research focuses on public mental health and substance abuse treatment in the United States, healthcare reform, evidence-based practice implementation and sustainment in complex systems, her current work entails using science theory and methods to support innovative program to reduce health and healthcare disparities for diverse populations. She is especially interested in using participatory methods to promote community engagement in the dissemination, uptake, and sustainment of effective interventions at the individual, organizational, and systems level. Next, we have Elise Tomaro. Elise is a, a cultural and applied anthropologist and research scientist at the Pacific Institute of Research and Evaluation. Her research focuses on the access to healthcare and insurance for Native American seniors and the implementation of science studies on evidence-based, community-driven, culturally relevant strategies to improve health and health services disparities for underserved population. Throughout her career, her work has emphasized participatory and community-driven strategies, critical pedagogy and knowledge sharing and the translation of research to policy. She has a sustained interest in understanding and fostering place-based social support and community connectedness to improve health and well-being. Finally, we have Eric Lujan. Mr. Lujan is the Director of Tribal Relations at Western Sky Community Care in Albuquerque, New York. He is an expert in healthcare policy and policy analysis. He has presented testimony on Native American health elder uh, before the state legislature and has served Pueblo communities by sharing his knowledge about health policy to aid in decision-making on all matters related to health care and health. And so with these absolutely phenomenal presenters, I am going to throw it back uh, to Emily, who is going to take over. So welcome, everybody, and thank you, Emily, and all for joining us today. Good morning, and thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about the work we've been doing with American Indian elders in the Southwest United States. Elise, Katie, and I are from the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, uh, PIRE is an independent nonprofit organization that's focused on conducting research that improves the health, safety, and well being of individuals, communities, and nations around the world. Eric is a leader in Native American health policy and he works with Western Sky Community Care. 
Western Sky Community Care is a Medicaid managed care organization in New Mexico, just to fill out those introductions. And this project was funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. It's our pleasure to have this time with you today to talk about some strategies that can help improve access to care for American Indian elders. And here are those objectives, so we didn't miss that. Um, the role, uh, today we're going to discuss the role of navigation services in helping American Indian elders manage their health, the many different types of support that elders can expect to find in a community, including in tribal senior centers, and navigation as a culturally congruent approach for assisting American Indian elders who are seeking health care. When we talk about cultural congruence, we're talking about interacting with and supporting elders in a manner that expresses respect for differences in culture, beliefs, values, and morals that exist across cultures. We're starting today with an overview of the Seasons of Care study. This study provides us with insight and information on American Indian elder health and health care across uh, a wide range of concerns, or health care access across concerns. We always like to start by thanking the many different people and partners that we've worked with throughout the duration of this process. And those folks are, and organizations are listed here. So the research questions of the study were, how do American Indian elders go about getting health care and what are their experiences with health care? How do elders understand health insurance and what are their experiences enrolling in and using health insurance? How do health professionals, and those are people like outreach workers, healthcare providers and staff, and administrators of health systems, and tribal leaders understand the factors that affect health insurance and health care for elders? And how do state and national policies like the Affordable Care Act affect care for elders? We presented the study to 20 tribal communities in the Southwest US, and of those eight agreed to take part. Um, some of those relied on the Indian Health Service or IHS for healthcare, and others had assumed total or partial control of healthcare delivery under the IHS Tribal Self-Governance Program. We also included non-reservation urban American Indian communities in the study. The participants in our study included elders from the eight tribal communities and three non-reservation urban areas, in addition to tribal leaders and health professionals, such as outreach workers, healthcare providers like doctors and counselors, and administrators. Our research can be described as mixed method, which means we collected both quantitative and qualitative data. Quantitative data are numbers and statistics. Qualitative data focuses on words and stories. In particular, we did surveys with elders to collect information about their healthcare experiences. We also conducted semi-structured interviews to better understand their experiences and hear stories from all of the participants. Finally, we did something called concept mapping, which is a technique for brainstorming and ranking ideas for improving healthcare for elders. With all of this information, we designed and piloted a user-friendly guide that's available on the internet. This guide is intended to provide accurate and up-to-date information that health professionals, elders, and their families can all use to help elders navigate healthcare and health insurance systems. We'll talk more about this guide later. The whole study was overseen by a group of American Indian elders and allies called the Seasons of Care Community Action Board. They helped us develop the research instruments and they assisted with recruiting participants. And they also have given us feedback on the results of the study and helped us to interpret and prioritize findings. And they have been essential to this project. The research was also conducted with the help of elder consultants who were from the communities in the study. And those elders were trained in conducting research and they joined researchers as they did the surveys and interviews to assist with communication and translation as necessary. So that's the overview of the study. I'll pass this over to Katie. Thanks, Emily. So, so unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all the study findings here today, but we'd like to briefly tell you about the specific findings that led us to think more deeply about how to get elders, families, caregivers, and health professionals the information and tools they need. During our interviews with elders, health professionals, tribal leaders, and others, we asked what makes it easy or hard for American Indian elders to get good health care and health insurance. In our interview and survey, participants responded with a wide variety of factors, but several common factors came up again and again. 
Both elders and the health professionals who work with them commonly told us that they did not know where to find good and reliable information about healthcare and about navigating healthcare systems. They needed support that is local and accessible. As one outreach worker explained, they had come upon this knowledge about healthcare and insurance through experience. So we're trying to change that culture and supplement it with somebody who can help. They have had they have not had somebody help them at no cost, somebody who can get them support services that they didn't know existed. I don't like to feel helpless, and I don't like others to feel that they're helpless. Our study participants also told us that elders experienced uncertainty about the kinds of healthcare services and medications that were available to them or covered by their insurance. It also was not easy for many elders to communicate confidently about services with healthcare providers and insurance companies. They also did not want to impose on their family members to help with such communication or to get the healthcare that they might need. An elder woman explained that elders are often uncomfortable talking to other people about their health issues. She explained, a lot of them will just say, no, I'm okay, I'm all right or they don't wanna be a burden to their families, so they won't say exactly what's been ailing them for a while. Another common concern that deterred elders from seeking healthcare or using their health insurance was the fear that they would incur medical expenses that they didn't know how to handle. Finally, our participants suggested that many elders struggled with the fact that interacting with healthcare systems required that they advocate strongly for themselves. For example, one community health worker described, a lot of times when my client has an appointment and they're not confident to tell them, meaning the healthcare providers, what's going on with them, I ask the client, if you don't mind, can I go with you so I can explain to the doctor what you're saying? Within tribal communities, there's a wide range of roles available for supporting elders. These depend on the resources available and the size and type of community. In our research and experiences, we've seen um, public health nurses, public health nurses, social workers, community-based um, professionals, um, sometimes called paraprofessionals, and these include community health workers, tribal community health representatives, patient navigators, and other outreach workers. Um, another really important role, um, and, and it's not always available to everybody, um, would be the role fulfilled, fulfilled by benefits coordinators. The people in these roles can usually be relied on to help with a wide range of tasks, um, depending on their level of training and certification or licensure. These tasks can include monitoring blood sugar, nutrition guidance, patient education, diabetes education, health promotion, transportation, and help with paperwork. And that's where the benefits coordinators really come in, helping with the paperwork required by insurance companies. There is a also a whole other set of informal tasks that depend a lot on the level of comfort, range of knowledge, and, and job. These can include things like responding to elders' needs and questions, including questions about insurance, like Medicare and Medicaid, finding payment for healthcare, scheduling appointments, obtaining a, essentials for daily living, like firewood and cell phone service, and providing to support to care for grandchildren or other family members. In essence, people in these roles are the de facto go-to supports for American Indian elders in tribal communities. They are the ones who will go the extra mile, like this community health worker. If I can't provide the answer, I find the resource that they can approach, and then I always give them the option. If these resources don't work, come back to me or contact me then I'll help you some more. They describe being motivated by their values, including by the value of respect for elders. Um, another community health worker said, I have a certain responsibility to uphold our senior population. They are our key component to who we are. They are the ones who taught us the old ways. To be able to take care of them and prolong their life, that's a great responsibility for anybody. The task of negotiating complex health care and health insurance systems also presented challenges to people who work with elders, such as the outreach workers, the health care providers, and benefits coordinators. The professionals we spoke with emphasized that they did not necessarily find it much easier to find reliable information than elders did themselves. 
Often professionals had expertise in one area, such as Medicaid enrollment, but struggled to help elders who had questions about, for example, Medicare. Many explained that they relied on the strength of relationships and knowledge among the staff in their own agency to find answers to elders' questions. For example, a tribal outreach worker said, I always tell them, um, meaning elders, if you need anything or if you want to find out more about your health issue, I'm here to help you. If I can't, if I didn't know the answer, I tell them I will find out or I'll bring somebody that knows. Other professionals noted that their ability to help elders came from their personal experience helping family members, like this tribal liaison for a health insurance company whose knowledge about navigating healthcare and health insurance came from helping her own grandmother. However, this individual also noted that when issues arose that she did not have personal experience with, like the problem of social security fraud, she didn't know how to help. A through line that we've seen in our research is the difficulties that elders have had in communicating with healthcare providers. Most notably, language barriers communicating between indigenous languages and English, and translating medical terminology or medical jargon, or, or even insurance-related jargon for that matter, to English or to indigenous languages. Community-based professionals frequently step in to interpret and translate for elders in, in, in these kinds of situations, which we'll describe further in the next few slides. The community-based professionals described um, joining elders at their medical appointments, acting to fill in important details about their health with the providers, um, information that elders aren't always comfortable speaking about themselves, as this community health re re uh, representative explained. Um, sometimes they'll ask us their questions, like if the patient wants to say something but not have the doctor in the room, and then they're scared to ask the doctor. Then they'll just ask us in our language, and then we'll go ahead and ask the doctor for what they're asking in English. They won't know how to put into words what they want to say. That's how I translate for them. They'll talk to me, and then they won't feel uncomfortable. And then I'll explain that to, to them, meaning the doctors. Finally, many of the professionals we interviewed noted that one of their most important roles was helping to communicate cultural information on behalf of elders to healthcare providers who may not be familiar with their cultural values or norms. For example, one tribal community health representative described how they intervene periodically to help healthcare providers provide to deliver more culturally congruent care. Um, I, I could speak for our community like, uh, you know what, this might be, not be a really good thing because in our culture or, or whatever, or you might want to be sensitive to this part, or just knowing our cultural background is what makes it a little bit easier. The community-based professionals are also essential in helping to bridge gaps between an elder and their family. They do this by sharing health information with family, particularly for elders who live alone, and helping to convey the scope of an elder's health condition, especially with those elders who don't have family members who can join them at doctor's appointments due to work or, or family conflicts. Um, when we spoke with community-based professionals, they spoke to the qualities that they felt helped them in their work with elders. And, and these included things like having knowledge of the culture and being proficient in native language. Um, this was considered very important in their work as we've discussed um, because it helped establish them within their community and with the elders they served. They also talked about the importance of spending time sitting with elders, listening to their stories and being present in the community. So their connection to the culture and the people within the community was seen as authentic. Finally, they described their role as being a resource to the elder, providing the person with the knowledge they need so that the elder can make informed decisions instead of making decisions for elders. And that was a really big theme um, in terms of enabling elders to make their own decisions and not having the decisions of others imposed on them. Next slide. Learning about health insurance is complex. Um, most community-based professionals learn on the job or through personal experiences. And the complexities they commonly encounter include um, elders living alone or having family members who work long hours, as I just mentioned. Um, this left elders vulnerable to isolation. 
It also made um, it hard to get families involved in care and insurance related decisions. Because of such circumstances, community-based health professionals or paraprofessionals do benefit from training to, to help triage, refer, consult, or introduce resources to help support elders when those resources are available. Um, often tribal senior centers serve as the hub for resources for um, seniors, placing the people who provide help and the activities elders rely on in one location. This is not true for every tribal community. Um, in general, though, when, when there is a center in, uh, available, the services provided include, you know, um, nutrition services, which are absolutely vital and valuable, social programming and support. I mean, it's a place where you get to meet your, your, your friends and your, your family. And, to, and we know that social support is one of the biggest protective factors for health. Um, it's a place where you can access transportation and get to do cool things. Um, they also house offices often for um, tribal resources for elders, um, like housing support, legal assistance, home care and personal care support, and other caregiving programs. Um, sometimes the offices of uh, community health workers and community health representatives can be found in, in senior centers, um, and also offices for other caseworkers. And ultimately, our participants emphasized an urgent need for specific, culturally relevant information, resources, and tools to help elders, as well as their families, learn about their full range of healthcare and insurance options. And, and we can tell you that the elders in our study were not availing themselves of this full range for a variety of reasons, um, some of which were discussed today. Um, you know, th there, there is a need for this information to also help overcome financial, cultural, and geographical barriers to healthcare and insurance, and, and to, to help um, elders manage their own healthcare and insurance decisions. So now I'm going to pass on to um, Eric Lujan. Thank you, Katie. Um, the project we worked on was of asking, what is navigation and how can it help elders? And that's really what we focused on or what I, I focus on in this project. So navigation, navigation is a community-based patient-centered way to get elders the healthcare they need by helping them move through the healthcare delivery, the health insurance and the health coverage systems. And that's a really important word is we have a lot of different systems that we um, as Native Americans have to interact with. Um, it involves, <clears throat> mobilizing people and resources um, that elders trust. Um, and we've already mentioned several of those organizations previously. Um, it also looks helps to honor um, the elders' values and the desires, things like you know, trans translation and having um, you know, family members able to attend uh, doctor's appointments and such. Um, the hope is to stop the, the elder from developing any serious health conditions so that may negative in, negatively impact the elder for you know long periods of times. The hope is to it, stop them from even developing, ever developing. Um, we would also want to make sure that they get their. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Uh, we also want to make sure that we increase the uh, education of the individuals and families in the community knowledge. This helps the elder to be able to um, overcome any barriers that uh, that may exist. You know, we we as I as I mentioned, we have many different healthcare systems that we have to have to navigate through. And a lot of times, um, when elders hit a hit a road or or hit a barrier when it comes to accessing a certain provider or getting denied a certain service with outside of Indian Health Service system, um, they often stop right there. So um, health navigation is a good way to arm the individual um, with the information they need to kind of overcome uh, those barriers. So what does navigation do and how can it help? So navigation is a great cost savings way to get people uh, what they need so they don't end up getting um, really expensive medical bills, um, you know, it's it's way to make sure that um, we're getting the right care at the right time, and so uh, navigation can include uh, scheduling appointments for elders, um, arranging safe transportation to get to uh, doctor's appointments. A lot of times, um, we may have a healthcare provider or uh, Indian Health Service clinic um, 
that uh, serves as a primary care clinic, um, but then elders may be referred to specialty care or need to go to an inpatient uh, facility uh, for some time. And, and health navigation can help to schedule those, um, provide, uh, provide transportation and access to transportation so that the elder can actually make those, uh, those different appointments. And I think one of the biggest things that navigators can do is help elders understand and assist with completing uh, the complex paperwork that often goes along with um, getting those referrals, um, making sure that um, when an elder shows up to that off, uh, outside um, organization, that the organization understands why they're there and that um, there's no issues with being admitted or, or obtaining services. Um, the bottom line is that good navigation can make it possible for elders to make informed decisions about their health care um, when communicating and better able to communicate effectively with, a, with their health care providers. And this isn't all, just for the elders, this also applies to their families and their communities themselves. You know, as we've heard in previously in the presentation, a lot of our Native American and our tribal programs, they kind of learn on the spot. And um, you know, navigator kind of can kind of help educate, you know, families that 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 often go with our elders to doctor's appointments or community organizations that uh, are responsible for for transporting or making sure that those elders get the care that they need. You know, when um, a lot of times elders uh, hit hit those barriers, and there's a few uh, specific instances. You know, in, in the work that I've done with a lot of the elder communities, and there's especially around the change in the way um, healthcare is being delivered at this point. You know, telemedicine is a it was a big it was a huge innovation during uh, COVID nineteen, um, but we often felt that elders, you know, when when talking to elders, they they didn't like telemedicine, not because it was new and 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 a, a new technology, a new way to deliver healthcare system, but because elders didn't feel like they were getting anything out of it because there was no. Um, individual in person to to actually touch, um, you know, feel to 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 visually verbally examine you. Uh, everything was done by by a computer or by a, a small screen. And they didn't really feel like their needs are being met. And so understanding that and being able to um, have an individual there with them to kind of talk through what the what the provider on the other end of the screen is very critical, um, especially as we start moving towards utilizing more tech, more and more technology um, in the healthcare delivery space. You know, a lot of elders had a difficulty understanding the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. And, and hey, let's face it, everybody kind of doesn't understand the difference between um, those two systems. And then you throw in um, the Indian Health Service Purchaser Referred Care System that also provides payment for services. It gets really complex and navigation is a good way to, to help elders understand, you know, for, for IHS, you use this, this, this different system. And for Medicaid, you use your card. You know, it's very, um, very easy to kind of mix all of those up. Um, but um, this is some highlights of, of our work within the communities. Great, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And, and Eric has so much experience doing this kind of navigation work. So he's just a, a, a fountain of knowledge. Um, so as my colleagues have mentioned, so the, the professionals that we spoke with were already providing these services uh, to elders. Most of the elders that we talked to, you know, had a, a family member or a friend or some kind of a professional or community-based person that they would really, really repeatedly rely on um, for help um, as they were trying to navigate through healthcare systems. But all of those individuals, whether they were healthcare providers or outreach workers or family members, needed better information and resources to negotiate all the questions that elders had. And so as we heard this need over and over again, it led us to ultimately develop um, what is currently now a web-based guide for elders, caregivers, and health professionals. We call it the Seasons of Care Native Elder Health Guide. Uh, the web address there is on the screen, nativeelderhealthguide.com, if you're interested. Uh, right now, it's mostly New Mexico focused because that's where we did a lot of our research, but it does include many resources that are pertinent to elders elsewhere. Um, we designed, 
Uh, we can go to the next. Oh yeah, there we go. We designed the Seasons of Care Guide to be a culture and patient-centered way to support individuals and professionals who care for elders in their efforts to get elders the health care that they need. So the guide provides clear, easy to use information and tools that are useful for helping elders as they move through healthcare systems and health insurance systems. The goals of the guide are to help connect elders to people and resources that they can trust and to honor elders' values and desires. Um, we worked with our Community Action Board of American Indian Elders and Allies to organize the information in the guide into culturally meaningful topic areas that are themed around the seasons and the traditional activities that take place in each season. And then our, um, our, our advisory board and our elder consultants also helped us design some of the key content, like a health diary and an interactive page that helps users learn how to use their health insurance card that I'll show you here. So ultimately, the, the guide is really supposed to be a hub of information. So instead of requiring elders and caregivers and, and folks to just, you know, Google and look all over the place for the right answers, we tried to kind of compile all the best information we could find in one place. So I'll show you so the, the individual seasons and what they focus on. First, um, our elder uh, advisory board wanted a spring season that talked about cultivating wellness. So we described it as a spring as a time to plant new seeds. Topics in this season will help elders cultivate wellness. So in this season, there's various kinds of information to support elders' health and well-being. Um, that features resources to help elders with nutrition, exercise, and staying active. And there's also um, a page for COVID-19 information and assistance. And here uh, on the screen, I've just showed you a couple of those pages. So on the left, there's the page about staying active, and you can see there's a link to senior services page and uh, other kinds of information. And then on the right-hand side, there's a health diary that we designed that elders can um, download and print and used to maintain their uh, health information, take to their doctor's appointments and things like that. Uh, the summer season on the next slide, summer is a time for growing and maintenance. Topics in this season will help elders access and use healthcare resources. So uh, summer really focuses on maintaining health by using tips, tools, and information to help elders use healthcare access healthcare and use healthcare. So we really have step-by-step -step guides about um, finding a doctor that will accept you as a new patient. Um, what happens if you can't get through on the phone? What happens if you're not happy with a healthcare um, appointment that the doctor didn't explain things well? Um, how do you get your questions answered? How do you complain about um, a, a healthcare appointment that wasn't adequate? Um, this is also where users can find information about the Indian Health Service and the other places they can go for care. And so on the screen here, I showed you two pages that are under this season, how to manage your medication. So there's um, suggestions for um, questions that you might wanna ask your provider or pharmacist uh, when you get a new medication and how it interacts with all your other medications. Um, and then on the right, uh, there's our page about where to go for healthcare that just gives you a, a list of all the various places that are available. Um, the fall season is next. Fall is a time for harvesting and getting ready for winter. Topics in this season will help elders learn and make decisions about health insurance. So uh, the fall season is really about choosing and using health insurance. It includes um, clear explanations of all the different kinds of health insurance, as well as a step-by-step -step guide to using health insurance and resolving problems that elders might have with health insurance. So here on the screen, you can see on the left how to choose a health insurance provider. So we provided uh, guidance about the different kinds of things that elders might wanna take into consideration as they're choosing a health insurance provider. And then on the right-hand side, there's a little interactive feature to help you figure out how to use your health insurance card. So what does, it, what does all the information on the health insurance card mean and how do you use it um, to pay for your health care? And then on the winter season is the last one. Winter is a time for reflection and preparing for the future. So topics in this season will help elders and caregivers plan for their long-term health and financial needs. Um, we have various kinds of tools to kind of help elders reflect on their values, their desires, their needs, and work with their 
family and caregivers to plan for the future. So there's conversation tools um, for having some of these conversations with elders and caregivers. There's practical support for caregivers. There's information about legal planning and financial planning and different kinds of help for aging at home. So here I've shown you just a couple of the pages on the left is a, a chunk of our page on advocating for elders. What are the things to take into consideration as you're advocating for an elder? And then on the right is our page on advanced directives. And this just um, uh, outlines the, the various pieces of advanced directives and the different kinds of advanced directives and um, what kinds of resources you might need to establish those kinds of advanced directives. So we know that many elders are uncomfortable with digital technology. And so an, a website is maybe um, an odd choice, but um, we chose the website format to make sure that it was easy to use and responsive to the changing nature of healthcare and insurance systems. So because all this information is constantly changing, we really wanted a website so that we could make sure that it was always up to date and would always um, point people to the right place. And also we had multiple end users in mind. So it wasn't just elders, but also the people that elders work with um, and their families. So when we were testing the guide, we tested it with folks that were interacting with elders on a daily basis. And we really found that when an elder could sit down with somebody they trust to use the guide, that was a really ideal situation. So the elder and the person that they trust, their you know, child or grandchild or, or a healthcare provider, they could use the tool together to kind of navigate to the places that they needed and look at the information. And then as elders looked at it, you know, things would kind of jump out at them and they would say, oh, I want to look at that piece, you know. So as a website, the guide provides clear, actionable information and tools and resources that are accessible to anyone. And then also the website is private. So we knew that was really a concern for elders, that their information was private and confidential. So it doesn't collect any information of any kind. Um, you can search for information, you can look at a map, but it doesn't collect any information from the elder at all. Um, and then it can also be used by elders themselves or by somebody that an elder trusts most. So that um, is our web-based guide. And I think it goes back to Emily now for just a, a final wrap up. Thank you so much for attending. We are very happy to um, discuss what we've talked about today. If anybody is interested in further information about the study, wants to see our publications, um, please feel free to reach out to anybody on our team. There's our contact information. And um, we'd love to talk more about this in the remaining time um, left in this session. Uh, the, there's a question, is it okay for us to share your resources and use them locally in our states? Absolutely, that's why we're um, put, putting them up here. Um, they're here for you to use. They're paid by tax taxpayer dollars. And on the, on the website, you may find that the information is, is really specific to New Mexico, but it will usually give you a, a good clue about where you need to go in your own area. So it might say, you know, this is the office you need to go to for this information in Albuquerque, but, you know, you can usually find a similar office in your own area. So you may have to kind of translate it for your own area since it's so focused on the Southwest right now. Um, I'd also like to add, if people have suggestions for improving the guide or things that we might want to build into it, we, we you know, do intend to regularly update it. So you should feel free to, um, you know, share, share, share your insights. Um, and I think there is a way to do that on the website, correct, Elise? Our contact information is there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm in Alaska and I work at the Alaska Native Medical Center. The system in Alaska appears to be a little different from the system in the Southwest US. I'd like to learn more. I will email you. Please do. And yeah, um, Alaska, uh, the Alaska Native system is, um, they've used the uh, self-determination stuff that we talked about earlier in a different way than a lot of the people in the lower 48 have done. Um, so please do email us. Do you, should we put our email contact information up for another second so folks can write it down? And um, the slides, uh, as we reminded, uh, spoke of earlier, will be made available online at cms.gov. And I see that there is a question on the website, find a clinic, didn't bring up a lot of resources in the tribal area I used as an example. Um, 
do you mind sharing what area you used as an example, uh, Roxanne? If you don't, if you don't feel comfortable, that's okay. Um, that is a you know an evolving piece to find a clinic, um, but it it may be you know specific to to our area again there. Oh yeah, so I just used my hometown in um, Kanta, Arizona. Okay, yeah, I mean it may not be um, because again it's it's pretty specific to New Mexico. It might not be super helpful for for Arizona just yet because um, we really. Um, spent most of our time thinking about our own area um, for now, unfortunately. Like Katie has something. What were you going to say, Katie? No, I mean, we learned a lot about what it takes to do the find the clinic function. <laughs> How we had to really kind of pour through all the local resources. And, and it was a resource constraint to us that we weren't able to like fan out more broadly because we did have that aspiration. I would like to say, you know, we're open to opportunities as well. If there are communities that want to adopt something like this guide for, 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 for their local areas and to, you know, to work with their local IT people to like create that find a clinic function that really hones into the services that are in those, in their particular area. Um, so that's something we've talked about. And so we're definitely open to those kind of collaborations. Um, and making this resource available to others in ways that they could also tailor for their communities. And I see that Sherry has put in the chat box that CMS has resources on their website as well. So you may wanna you wanna check in on that as well. All there right. was a any question. more questions? So at the very uh, during the presentation, Barbara asked, you mentioned outside facilities. Are there dedicated native owned acute care facilities available for this population? Um, and Eric responded, there are very few Native American owned acute care facilities that are not direct Indian Health Service providers with further information about how UNM is one that is contracted with their own health sciences center. But I think that's a really, um, it's an interesting question. And um, maybe Eric, if you want to, can you speak to that a little bit more about how acute care um, is working right now with IHS and uh, 638s? Sure, of course, and and of course, I I speak from the perspective of being within the um, within the Albuquerque area. So that's that's kind of what I draw on, and I know that that um, the systems are are going to be different um, in different states. So um, at least in New Mexico, we've seen um, with a lot of the tribes going what we call self governance, pulling resources away from the Indian Health Service and 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 providing more more services locally. The funding for the larger systems is 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 dwindling, and so because of that, mm -hmm. um, we see a lot of our health, acute care centers, um, our what we call what we're called hospitals, being downgraded from hospital status, acute care facilities to more of a primary care clinic with possible, you know, other wraparound services like behavioral health or dental um, being included in them. And so that's, that's really why um, it's, it's more important now to understand like where those referral points are for, for Indian health service, because they will be referring if an individual comes in and they need to be in, uh, they need an inpatient or they need to be um, admitted to a hospital, you know, that Indian health service provider now has to look at the system around them in order to refer that patient. And in New Mexico, we, we, you know, we have very few hospitals, we have very few resources um, that we can draw upon. And oftentimes, you know, uh, a, 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 um, an individual that may be like located in the central part of the state might actually be referred all the way into Phoenix or into Denver or into um, Dallas and El Paso sometimes, you know, hundreds of miles away from their community because that's where the open resource is within the Indian Health Service referral system. And um, whereas if they were, if the Indian Health Service understood that they had a, that that member may have had insurance, and that there was a facility within that insurer's network that had an open bed, that's an easier referral that's lo more local, where you're not removing that individual from the community. And, and um, you know, oftentimes we have better outcomes that way when, when the individual, even if they are put in patient, whether it's a hospital or a nursing facility, that um, patients have better outcomes when they're, when they're closer to home and able to see family. 
And then in other states, we have tribes who have been able to use their self-determination funds to cr actually create whole hospitals, um, depending on the size of the tribe and how they manage the funds that they have. They can do that um, and have pretty solid care for their tribal members where they don't have these kinds of complications. Um, but it really depends on where you are and wh what tribe you belong to. Um, but this is where navigation really comes in because you need people who are very savvy and understand all of these different systems because most, most everybody does not, it's very few people who understand how to get from point A to point B, how to make sure that all of those different points are paid for, how to make sure all the different appointments line up and transportation, all those different things um, get put in order so that the patient um, doesn't get doesn't fall between the cracks. Thank you, Emily and uh, Eric. Are there any other questions? Um, I've got the question and answer and there are none, none in the chat box. Um, so, you know, is there, you know, I'd like to be respectful for anybody that might have a question that you want to add to the chat box. Emily has just put in a, a website that um, will be helpful into the chat box. We have a, a hand raised from the attendees, April Rubin. She, uh, right. They have a question, allowing them to talk. All right, April, can you uh, ask your question? Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. I am a benefit specialist out in the Pueblo of Laguna here in New Mexico. And I worked really closely with Eric as well when we first started um, collaborating here on the Pueblo. Um, great information, I love it. I just want to encourage everyone that's on the webinar today to do those collaborative efforts within your states, within your MCOs for your Medicaid category, as well as your Medicare, your Advantage plans, create those communication barriers so that way you're able to move forward to provide that clarity for your elders or anyone in general, their caregivers, because that's what we have done and created here on the Pueblo of Laguna as the Benefit Specialist Program. We do collaborate a lot within our community. We collaborate with our brokers, our MCOs. So it's really helped us build our knowledge to be able to understand the 638 clinics, the IHS, um, again, finding that direction and stability and efficiency and consistency of healthcare. So these, our elders aren't being drugged from one facility to another. Um, just build that communication, reach out to your clinics, reach out to anybody out there willing to help you build your knowledge because it is beneficial. And, I'm standing on one of Eric's guinea pigs. <laughs> I was really very honored to work with him when we started working with the Be Well in the um, New Mexico um, Obamacare when that came into play. Um, so I've learned a lot from him. So again, you guys just encourage communication and collaborative efforts. Um, great presentation. That was what I just wanted to share. Thank you, April. It's really nice that you put this affirmation out there and really appreciate it. So um, anyone else, uh, any question that you'd like to ask? Well, if not, um, I would just like to um, thank Emily, Louise, Kathleen, and Eric for joining us today and discussing how navigation helps elders manage their health care and access to care. In closing, I'd like to remind everyone today's webinar was recorded and that the audio and presentation slides will be made available at a later date on cms.gov. Thank you again for joining today's webinar and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, and uh, that does conclude our session today.